I think we're ready, and I think that's a great way to start is thanking these sides for allowing this talk and understanding the importance of it, such that we're usually focused on our practitioner side of, of uh, what we do every day. And um, generally that means we leave out the soft skills and we leave out the human stuff. And so I really applaud these sides for uh, bringing awareness to some other topics that really uh, do challenge us every day and, and that we can all change together. And that's why this group of lovely ladies came together is that we wanted to raise awareness, raise awareness in uh, the different types of careers that are out in cyber that aren't strictly being uh, very, very technical and uh, are, some of us up there are, and um, ask all of you to help us solve a very difficult challenge that we have in the community right now. We're short, uh, you know, statistics are all over the place, but anywhere from, you know, 500 to a million positions. We certainly don't know exactly yet. We're all trying to figure it out, but we know it's a lot and we know it's growing. Uh, as we listen to Mudge's speech just now, it's probably going to continue considering the vendors are creating <laughs> these challenges. But that's another story, and so we're going to deal with the, the here and now, and that is we've got 10% max uh, females in cyber. And of that 10%, there's about 2% in leadership. So we represent the 2% in leadership. And uh, that is really wonderful because they are very special women up here. And yet we want more. And we know that we can't just rely on our education system. We need to, as a community, recognize that we're not marketing or selling the positions in cyber correctly. We are selling one position out in the media and education, and that's strictly definitely tactical, you know, software engineering, uh, network engineering, and uh, as we all know now, there's tons of different roles. So, we're going to introduce ourselves, we're going to share our stories and our different career paths and the different jobs that we've had, some wisdom along the way, and, uh, and then our 15 minutes will probably be up, so uh, that's how we have time for today. So I'll start, I'm your moderator, my name is Deidre Diamond. I'm the founder of CyberSN and CEO of CyberSN. I've also founded a uh, not-for-profit called Brain Bay that has nothing to do with the way we all look and everything to do with uh, let's not ban booth babes, let's train them and make them brain babes. And so CyberSN is on a mission. We're bringing um, women with liberal arts degrees, women that have gone out and had children and want to come back to the workforce, and we're going to be training them to be level one incident response folks, uh, analysts, and we're going to help uh, bring uh, women into the field. Uh, my story is I'm a liberal arts major. I'm a criminal justice sociology major. I grew up in California. I happened to stumble upon two serial entrepreneurs who um, had a, a staffing agency, a small one at the time, technical. I joined, and five years after I joined, we went from 2 million to 89 million in 36 offices across the country, and I was vice president of sales with them for 10 of my 13 years. And they are the same founders of Rapid7. So uh, I got the opportunity to leave the technical staffing business and, and be the first vice president of sales at Rapid7. So uh, I was employee number 19, and I was with them up to 50 million of recurring revenue. I spent four years building that organization with amazing people. One moose, for anybody that knows what that means. The culture is spectacular. Uh, some of you might not have uh, had the best phone calls from salespeople many, many, many times, but I will tell you that if you can consider that we didn't have any VC cash until we were at seven million, but we knew we had a good product, we were banging down doors. So I apologize if you got too many calls. However, it was the only way to get the message out. And we definitely had something better for you practitioners. So we believed it and we went after it. Uh, from there, I went to become CEO of one of our other companies, Percussion Software, where Rapid7 was uh, born from. Toss Giacomakis was there. He's the one that built Nexpos. Uh, that was one of our first software companies, and I went to restart it. New products, content management, content marketing. Had a lot of fun. Uh, made the jump from VP to CEO. Uh, very, very interesting, different world. Uh, had a lot of fun. However, I really missed the cyberspace. And uh, I decided that it was time to do one of my own stories. And so that's how CyberSN was bred. And CyberSN is focusing on staffing for cyber professionals. So I put the two together. But we're also building a solution because digital search is absolutely broken. It's ridiculous. That's how hard it is for you folks to find jobs is terrible. And uh, so we're, we're building some solutions to fix that. Having a ton of fun based in Boston, but we're national. And uh, so I can tell you that, you know, coming into this field and getting to work side by side practitioners my whole career, it's been amazing. I love, my, I love what I do. I love this industry. I 
uh, get to travel the world, I get to make great money, I get to be on the forefront of what's happening. I remember being 22 looking for an HTML programmer for Earthlink. I remember the first time I heard Visual C++, it was, you know, Virgin Games asking me to find them a developer. I have been side by side watching this industry and I love you all and so not only is it a lot of fun to work beside you, it's also a lot of fun to solve some human problems that we're having. So that's why I'm here, that's what I'm doing, that's my career path and we'll share some words of wisdom later. I'd like to pass the mic at this point and uh, hear more from these ladies but uh, it's a true pleasure to be here and let you all know that there's that, that somebody that's not technical can be a CEO of a software company and, uh, and that's the true message. All right, here we go. I'm going to pass on. I have a mic. Oh, you have a mic. I have a mic. Um, I'm Vitala Shadotan. I'm a Senior Director of Marketing at Cyber Reason. My career started at Unit 8200. As you can hear in my accent, I'm Israeli. So, as all Israelis, we have obligatory uh, service in um, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, and some of us are, get selected um, to some special missions. Um, I was part in 8200, that is the cybersecurity unit. I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about what this world is. And there is gender equality there because both female and male start at the age of 18 and go to the same uh, unit together and just get trained on the job didn't have any information about it. That was the best job of my life. Did it for two and a half, almost three years. It was amazing. Never had such a job with such an impact. Then out of uh, uh, that, went to school, studied biotech, and ended up uh, spending 12 years in Procter & Gamble doing marketing. Um, moved with my husband that has spent all his career in software and in cybersecurity space. Moved to the US, and then got into a point that I want to change. I missed that technology that I had in the past. I missed the, the kind of uh, um, spice that you had every day, that new things happen. Um, consumer goods were awesome, but it was kind of a slow industry. And my husband said, move to security. You have to do this change. And I was like, I don't know. I didn't learn software. I don't know anything about technology. Time passed since I started this. Uh, and he really, really pushed me to do it, and I jumped right at seven. Uh, worked at the time um, as a product uh, manager, uh, product marketing manager, and then evolved and moved and learned the space. Um, and I want to tell you all, and I want you to tell your kids, it's something that anyone can learn. It's not necessarily something that is taught in school or taught in certain classes. Obviously, there are classes. But it's something that if you're interested, you can just go on and learn it. You can teach yourself. There are so many ways and so many smart people to teach you that. Really glad that I did this move. Uh, I'm today with Cyber Reason, um, a growing startup. It's amazing. The journey of this industry, there is no better time to join the industry than today. The opportunities are endless. All right. Um, my name is Sandy Carielli, and my journey into security started when I was in college. I was a math major as an undergrad, and my main interest in math was number theory, and the only real practical application of number theory was cryptography. So I became interested in that and studied it a little bit. And knew I wasn't going to be a cryptographer or anything, but thought it was kind of cool stuff. And so coming out of college, I found a job as a software engineer at BBN in their cyber trust group. So I was doing programming for things related to PKI. And I really enjoyed that. But I also found, in retrospect, you know, I had a very narrow sense of what security was. I was looking at crypto, I was looking at PKI. I didn't really see or have awareness of a world beyond that until a friend of mine recruited me into AppState. And I then got this exposure to everything in application security and network security and policy and started to see you know, a broader world there. Started consulting, doing a lot around that. And after about four years, decided, you know what? Being in a startup is really interesting. And I want to understand a little bit more about the decision-making process and building a business. So I went back to business school. And in doing so, I ended up stepping away from security for, I guess, about four years after that. Out of business school, I ended up doing sales for a really sort of hard technology company, mechanical engineering, for a little while, and then moved into product management. And what I found I liked about product management was that 
hey, I've been an engineer. I had been a consultant. i had done a little sales. i had done a little marketing. I knew how to speak all those languages. And so product management, which requires you to be so cross-functional, really appealed to me. But my first product management role, again, wasn't in security. And it wasn't until 2010 when an opportunity with RSA presented itself that I found myself back in security and I realized how much I missed it. And I realized how comfortable I felt in it, how much I liked the community and how much I liked having those conversations and being part of those problems and part of all of that stuff. And it was just, you know, the past five and a half years or so was really great because I got exposure to different technologies, different parts of the market, more people in the community and just had a really phenomenal experience there. And I ended up leaving RSA earlier this year, and I'm now finding myself contemplating, okay, what am I going to do next? And I feel like I'm at such a different, better spot than I was before because I have so much more breadth in terms of understanding the different types of options I have that I can look at product management, or I can look at product security, I can look at marketing, I can look at something more technical, that I have a lot of options, and I can choose the thing that's going to be the right next step for me versus feeling as constrained as I might have when I first got into the industry. Is it working? Um, my name is Nizar Karolich. Um, so my story is a little complicated. <laughs> um, so I'm, I grew up in a small Central Asian country called Kazakhstan. Uh, I finished high school when I was 16, and I had two options, either do finance or do computer science. And I, and I chose computer science. Um, it was fun. Uh, I finished my degree, and I was still young. I was 20 years old. I, I, I felt like I, I need to get out of the country, travel, do stuff. Um, so I started applying for scholarships. And um, I got a scholarship to do master's in India. So I said, yep, yeah, uh, you know, any, any, any place outside my country will work. Uh, <laughs> so my, my parents freaked out, my mother, um, she was a doctor, she's like, what? Um, but I didn't care, so I had a best friend. Um, she's, um, so we, we, we applied, we got in, and we went to New Delhi to, um, to do a master's and to learn English, because we didn't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, um, but that was, those three years we spent in India, that was the best time we spent. Um, we made a lot of friends, we learned a lot of new things, uh, learn English and um, so after that um, again I had this urge that I wanted to do more travel more do stuff and I applied for internship um, in DC with World Bank it's an international um, organization and I got in and um, so five months after my graduation here was in DC a huge United States of America, it was like, you know, a crazy thing. And my internship was in IT department in security, um, security group. So that's how I got introduced to security. So I worked with them for um, two and a half years. I did a lot of um, PKI stuff, smart cards, um, identity management, user provision. So it was all on infrastructure security. And then, um, so it was a program, it, it was um, with a limited, um, it was a two year, two and a half year program, and after that you, you're supposed to go outside of organization and, and then it reapply after two years. So I started looking for a job, and it was 2008. Job market, market was horrible, let alone security. And I was in security, in DC, every job I applied needed clearance, because it was all contract. You know, government jobs, and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? And I applied for a position in um, EMC, and it was in um, application, doing application security, but uh, I didn't know anything. So in my interview, you know, they're asking about buffer overflows and SQL injection and you know, <laughs> CVE and CVSS. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not getting this job. Um, but I got it. So that's how I moved to Boston. Um, so I've been with the EMC for eight years. I started as a security engineer. Um, so I did um, security development life cycle. I did vulnerability response. And um, four years ago, I took a management role to manage the team. And that's what I've been doing. So yeah, that's my journey. Awesome. Awesome. Hi, 
My name is Sonia Gustad, and I am the security officer for Tufts Medical Center. It's an academic, 400 bed academic medical hospital right down the street, um, with a floating hospital for children, so a pediatric uh, group as well. Um, my road to security, I had no intention or desire to get into anything related to security. And here's my path. So I, I went to business school in Dallas. I'm a graduate of Southern Methodist University, undergraduate in um, management information systems out of the business school, and uh, also have a degree in uh, a Bachelor of Arts, uh, study art history while I was there as well, study art history in Madrid. My intent was to become an art broker for a big company <laughs> like Sotheby's and do something very glamorous. And, and this is glamorous too. <laughs> I tell myself that every day. <laughs> um, uh, my background is in management consulting, so I'm very, you know, process, procedure, policy, probably more business operations background than technical background per se. Always worked in IT space. Um, started consulting for Perot Systems, which is Ross Perot's old uh, management consulting firm. Uh, did some work with Dell Services when that when they got acquired. Uh, took a branch off and did some dot com consulting when that was the big end. Science Sapiens uh, were really popular. Did some work in San Francisco. So I think what really lends um, some intelligence to my job is that I've actually kind of seen the PL. I did some work at Texas Instruments. I've seen you know the silicon chips be made from sand all the way to through the manufacturing process. Same for paper, same for you know recycled plastics. So I kind of know a little bit about various industries, telecom industries. Um, and that's really informed my work as a security officer because the, the first thing that I do is tend to map what the business value is for whatever investment we're making in the security space or why does that make a difference. And it seems that that's um, really resonating with the executive suite as of late. We all know that it's hard to get budget um, when we're fighting with another you know, IT initiatives. Um, and so really mapping that value uh, is, is very challenging within the security space, but very, very rewarding for me when, it's, uh, when it comes to fruition. Awesome. Awesome. Such great stories up here. I think whether you know we're men or women, the interesting thing is that the security space is growing so quickly and it's so fast that there's all kinds of jobs. And I would encourage again, whether you're male or female, to if you have interest in other roles, to, to check them out. Because at the end of the day, there aren't enough of us. You're always going to have a place to be, even though I know again when you search, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. If you have patience, it can pan out for sure. So, uh, so hopefully, you know, everybody can take that from these initial stories. How about we move into a little bit uh, more of the female focus and share some stories that we have just from a perspective of raising awareness. We all believe that we wouldn't be sitting up here if it weren't for uh, men, particularly white men, uh, <laughs> who got us into this industry and were willing to train us. So you're not evil. Uh, at all, we love you, and we need help, right? We need more women in here. And so my story, you know, as you heard earlier, I've worked 19 years for the same two men that brought me into the industry, and uh, powerful cultures, definitely no sexism, it was all merit-based, and absolutely wonderful uh, promotion structures based on performance, and lots of different companies we can, you know, move in and out of, and. Um, all of that being said, there was a situation that uh, is an interesting story to hear so that, again, not everything is so obvious in terms of what can be, uh, you know, what can happen and, and, and a woman could get left behind, let's say. So uh, I'm 12 years into my 13-year career at staffing and I am the top vice president. There is no question on that because it's sales and numbers are really easy to count. And, uh, and all of a sudden I'm at a bar and the main founder that mentored me on the sales side, uh, who's uh, the money side of Rapid7, I hear him pitching the vice president of sales job to one of my co-peers. And yes, we occupied the same title, however, the, the track records were um, definitely different enough to suggest that I should be having that conversation. And, uh, and I, I, when I realized what was going on, I leaned over and said, wait a minute, are you pitching him a new job outside of this company? And I, why aren't you talking to me? And he's in front of my buddy, who we grew up in business with, and he said, Dieter, you just got married, and you've now got two stepchildren. I didn't even think you'd be interested. 
and genuinely, truthfully, coming from care, coming from love, right? I mean, he's groomed me for 12 years at that point. And I said, well, John, that's just not the case. And of course, I got the job. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> thank God I was at that bar. I generally didn't miss any bar moments. However, uh, you know, thank goodness I was there. And come to find out, there was one other VP who was uh, pitched the job that turned it down even before the one that I heard that was getting the pitch. And so now both, both of them, I'm sure, wish they had uh, done things differently. That being said, uh, interesting, right? Nothing malicious. And that's really something that I, I really want everybody to think about. But most discrimination isn't malicious. It isn't, so, you know, somebody gets out of bed every day and says, I'm gonna go be mean. Uh, there are those people, but we're slowly weeding them out, certainly in this industry. Uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, we need to be aware. We need to think outside of our own experiences. And, and that's a great story that I like to share. In the company that I work for, diversity was part of the beginning. I mean, uh, Leo, the CEO, says that when he started the company, there were just the three co-founders. It was clear to them that diversity needs to be thought of as of day one, and they need to bring in, because if it's an afterthought later, let's make it more diverse, it just doesn't flow, it, does, it doesn't fit. You know, cannot make it part of the DNA. It has to be part of the DNA when you start a company. He always talks about um, his day but being on the offense and understanding that offensive teams are very diverse. That's the interesting part. Um, they're diverse in nature because you need different perspective. You bring into the room different people from different backgrounds. Not necessarily the gender um, uh, diversity. But there is diversity. They're not just coders. They're people from different... If, if you need to hack into a bank, obviously you will bring the hackers, but you would also bring the guys that know a little bit about finance, somebody that worked in a bank that knows the procedure. So obviously there is gender um, diversity as well as different kinds of diversity. And I think that we don't understand it that much while the guys on the offense, I see it all the time. So it's really important, I think, that uh, we all as a community kind of embrace it internally and see the benefit. At the end of the day, we are fighting something that has diversity as part of the DNA. Ooh, that's interesting. interesting. That's really interesting. I mean, we only know our own experiences, right? We know what we know, and we need others around us that have had other experiences so that we can know more uh, and take on our adversaries in a more holistic uh, approach. That's awesome. Yeah. So I learned a really good lesson a few years ago. I was at a women's conference, and there was a speaker there, and I'll tell you who she was afterwards. But she was talking about the different approach that the women and men and on her staff responded when she offered them promotions. She said that a lot of the time when she offered promotions to the women on her staff, the first thing out of their mouth was, do you really think I can do it? to which her internal monologue is saying, well, yeah, that's why I offered you the promotion. <laughs> Whereas men on her staff would often say, well, hell yeah, it's about time. <laughs> and she you know, called that out as a very strong difference. Now, a few weeks later, I was offered a really significant promotion at work. And the <laughs> internal monologue in the back of my head was going, oh my god, holy crap, can I do this? <laughs> but having heard that a few weeks ago, I thought to myself, Okay, well, I'm not going to project that. I just said, absolutely, hell yeah, I can do that. I want to do that about time. And it really impacted me in terms of how I approached it and how I presented myself that I was not going to be tentative. I was not going to appear freaked out, even if I was freaked out, and really just you know, make sure that they knew that I valued myself enough and expected this, and I believed that I could do it. Um, and the person who gave this advice is now running for president. So. I love that story. Absolutely love that story. There's a ton of research that says that women do not go after promotions. Women do not go after raises. Uh, we're trained to um, not take the risk, really, and put ourselves out there. So again, another thing that you can help with the women in your life and help you know teach them, give them that same story. Because if you hadn't heard that story, who knows what your response would be. It'd be interesting. It you was know? really nice that it was there and it yeah. was sitting right in my mind when I'm having the conversation with, I think I was talking to the CTO and just, like, okay, right. I can do this. Yeah, thank goodness you had that story. Josh, did you want to say something? So, something crossed my mind is, as you were telling that story, just, you know, I've uh, 
hired and worked with uh, mm-hmm. not equally, of course, because not as many women in, in the security space, obviously, but both with very, very high act and very talented women and men. And one of the things that's interesting is I think that a lot of the guys that I work with think they have that same inclination internally. I mean, I think it's the standard representation of imposter syndrome, which is like, yeah. clearly, I'm not this smart. <laughs> like, what, 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 what's, but what I'm really starting to, just listening to, to some of the dialogue, is it feels like the, the imposter syndrome is is the same in both of these of these groups, but one of them is more like more likely to be like, you know, YOLO, I'm gonna go figure this out. And the other one's more likely to be like, eh, I'm not sure I can do it. Like, what right. is this like something that we're we're uh, bringing our daughters up? Is this is, is this like how we're raising our kids? Yeah. Like, what's risk taking? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not supposed to climb math. trees it's and okay. fall. But like, uh, I'd be, I'd just, I'd be interested in the thoughts. Like, like growing up, like why? Well, for you guys, like why do you think that that? Yeah, there is a, a really great um, TED talk about that. That we are not teaching our daughters to be brave. Like, you know, we are teaching them it's okay. You know, it, you know, like we teach up our sons to be brave. We are not teaching our daughters to be brave. I mean, that's. I mean, it's it's eye opening talk. So, as successful women though in adulthood, like how did you learn that? So, for like my. Uh, sister-in-law who's just starting to try and enter the, the computer science world. Like, how do you start to alter that mentality uh, uh, in adult or young young? I think women? we lucked out, and that's the problem. Meaning, somebody said something, right? You heard something. At least for me, I feel I lucked out. I feel like I I uh, got a chance to work for two men that were always saying I could do it. And as soon as I heard that, I was doing it, and I never looked back. I don't think but yes, my experience is totally different. Yeah. I guess I didn't get that affirmation along my career. What I really made a point of doing is observing what was happening in the room or the circumstances that were. I mean, I think that in this world of technology, our social skills are a little bit at, a, at, at peril because this, the skills that you learn, to me, um, in business at the time were you know reading a room, understanding people's needs, understanding the, what they wanted to get out of the conversation or the deal or what, whatever was uh, in front of you from a business perspective. And I think, you know, as a female, I always, I, I never, it never occurred to me to look for affirmation from others. I was really looking at my peer group, and they may have been predominantly, you know, men, very, very smart men, um, but just being very, very real, real about my talents in line with the other people that I was sort of swimming with at the time, and, um, and just accepting. So it's, I think it's something that happens internally. I think that, you know, if we build um, some sort of structure that's gonna, uh, you know, obligate society to, to you know, deem women worthy or young women worthy, I think that we're gonna be setting ourselves up for, for something that's not too stable. Can I jump into one thing on this? Because I'm reminded of being 10 years old and visiting the Boston Science Museum. And there was some quiz that was going on about are you tense in mathematics? Now, I loved math growing up, and I had no fear about it whatsoever. But the entire point of it and all the language around it is, well, women are often tense in mathematics. And this was the first time that I had ever heard about this as a 10-year-old from an external source at the Boston Science Museum. And it was, I mean, you know, and so that started to be something that I was aware of that people talked about, and I hadn't known until then that people did. And then actually, I think it was true until a few years ago, if you went into the Mathematica exhibit at the Boston Science Museum, when it had the whole timeline of mathematicians, the title said, Men of Modern Mathematics. Ooh. Yeah. Conditioning, yes. I just have a comment on that, which is that I think what you're saying is completely right, which is once you get to the point where you're, you always have to, as an adult, measure yourself against your own self-worth and, and find it within, right? Um, where, but then I also think about Sandy's story and that, you know, how do we then encourage, not, so how do we encourage girls from a young age to be able to take more risks, fail faster, um, you know, be more perseverant, um, when they reach obstacles, and there's actually some really interesting data on that. Um, they, one of the women at Simmons Conference last year had run a bunch of studies and basically said sports are one of the key ways that, that we can help young girls develop into you know to their self-confidence, their self-esteem, their resiliency, all the things that we need in order to put ourselves forth for that promotion. 
um, because those are the, you know, that, that's a good environment for them to try. So there's lots of things we also need to be doing when kids are young to encourage them to develop the skills that we want so that when they then get older, that point of they recognition. can have that self-esteem, yeah. that thing that says, yeah, I can do that. I think it's the same thing that happens when you reach a level in your career. My husband and I were just talking yesterday, and he said, you know, you reach a certain level and you look around, you're like, I have no... You know, you think about mentors, like, hmm, it's getting slim pickings <laughs> at this level, right, at this layer. So you have to kind of go find them yourself and maybe find people that inspire you differently than your, you know, a career track mentor. Maybe somebody that broadens things for you now than, than moves towards an upwards path. I really like the idea of let's just not treat men and women differently growing up, <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's teach everybody to be brave and confident and secure. And if that means climbing a tree and falling, then let the girls climb the trees too, right? Whatever that means, whatever that <clears throat> excuse me translates into, it does. Just let's not have a difference, and let's not dress them with juicy on their ass. I mean, seriously, it makes me crazy. I just talk about this at RSA. I mean, in all seriousness, it's you know there's that component of it too, right? So uh, it really is. Let's just not make a difference. Right. Who's got a, another story? Yes. Just um, another point. It's not only about when the girls are growing up. It's when you start to make it and when you start to get into into the rooms with the men. There's also differences in how women are treated when they're interacting with large groups of men in senior discussions. And if you try to be smart, aggressive, assertive, and straightforward, you get labeled a certain with a certain word that everybody yeah. knows what it is. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the men are that way, they're seen as superstars. So yeah. there's still those differences and bias, even when you're getting later on. And I see just about every head up behind. <laughs> you guys yeah. know what I'm yeah. talking about. The B so word. There's still, yep. there's still work to do there yeah. too. Yeah. And also start talking to our boys too. Yes. Right? Yes. And so that starts if we start taking it away at a younger age that there's differences. And our boys grow up. I have a boy and a girl, and it's been really interesting to raise both and see the biases that other people are trying to right. put on my children. Right. And I'm like, we don't. That's not what we actually do in our family. Right. You know, we treat everybody kindly. We hear all voices, and um, to watch them as they interact with their environment. Um, but I think it also starts early. I'm sorry, I'm Absolutely. Early. I absolutely want to hear from you, absolutely. You know, I like the point for it is, you know, different once you get into the space, right? And different meaning, how long have women been working with men side by side? How many years, everybody? Anybody know? Forever, ever. No, I'm like in the workforce, please. Uh, in terms of having the right to vote, having a say, even being able to get into the room. You know, me being an executive in a software company, you know, like, that's only been, it's been in the making for 40 years of our entire existence. So it's a, it's new. How do we work together? So once we're here, then how do we work together? How does sex not get in the way? How does, you know, all of that, uh, you know, past judgment and stereotypes not get in the way? Yeah. Uh, well, let's get a man talking for one second. Well, no, I just want to say, uh, you know, it's funny because sometimes it is attributed to gender bias, but I do see that there's a lot of idiot men, too. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I see people, it's like, how did that person get promoted? He doesn't know how to deal with people. He doesn't even know how to manage problems. He treats his people terribly. And so you see things like that. It's because there's just not enough emphasis on soft skills. Yes. And on well, what's on business. Yeah, yeah. So, so I do feel you know very upset about seeing that a lot yes. of times. It's terrible. It affects everybody. And then there's about the cultural thing you're mentioning too. You yeah. People from different cultures, like in Japan, mm. if you're interviewing, you're not supposed to brag about your yeah. accomplishments. So there's these cultural aspects that kind of promote people into these positions because they. They're very outgoing, even though they're a horrible fit for the job. Absolutely, absolutely. We have little training on management, leadership, soft skills, and we see uh, people moving jobs every 18 months. That's a massive disruption of humans not getting along. That means I like you and now I hate you. See you later. That's terrible, and it's happening everywhere. Yes. Back there. Okay. Yeah, we had a discussion at my workplace about um, 
these kind of issues being masked as quote unquote culture fit. Can you talk about that? That's and interesting. How to, how to overcome that. You know, I, I think that there's two things for me. One is I would say work to change it quickly and then get out if it doesn't. Right, meaning don't stick around a place where people aren't interested in treating others kindly and making such that everybody's got an even playing field. But the best way to wake all those people up is to leave them behind, right? To not participate in their in their game. So, uh, however, luckily I've never worked in one of those cultures. Thank goodness. Uh, so maybe one of the other ladies has some advice on that. Or uh, well, it's not necessarily malicious. It's just. They're blind to it because they right. think it's culture. Yeah, the millennials call it, you're not woke. My 26-year-old on uh, my Salesforce team told me that the other day. And when I was talking about this person just couldn't get what I was saying, she goes, oh, she, he's not woke. And I guess Beyonce made a song, it's a very common term, which means you're not awake. You're not, <laughs> you're not awake. And it is difficult for those that haven't experienced something to be awake. And that's why I say, help them get awake. And if they don't wake up, get the hell out. Because, you know, it's not going to be fun. It's, and you're, you're too hot of a commodity. <laughs> That's the great news. Yes. So um, I have two daughters, and I think environmental, you know, what you're surrounded in your family home plays a really big part. You know, if you have very gender specific roles, sometimes that's what you see. You watch TV, that's what you see. I'd like to ask the ladies up here um, how much has your upbringing influenced where you are today based on how you've perceived yourself, if at any? I can do that. So I'm one of four girls in my family. My dad never had a son, okay? Um, and my dad has a background in mechanical engineering, and that's what he pushed me to do science and stuff. And, and he always encouraged us. Maybe sometimes he pushed us really, really hard to get out of our comfort zone and to try new things. So I think, yes, I agree. Your, you know, your upbringing, your family, your surrounding environment will, will play a huge role. Yeah, I completely agree. My parents took me to a lot of science museums. Um, and I like to say I come from a line of female scientists. My mother was a nurse, my grandmother was a biochemist. And you know they both work part time, and so I had this, you know, set of elders that were encouraging an interest in this, and that definitely played a huge part. I bet you we all did. I bet you. Um, yeah, definitely. My dad exposed me to science. That's his great love, and we used to do it together on weekends. But I must say that I do remember being told, you know what? If you don't want to learn those kind of studies, it's okay. I did get this message, and I was resenting it. I do remember as a kid um, seeing this, you know, it's okay if you don't go to the highest grade in math. It's okay. It was this okay thing. Um, uh, I have one sister. Um, she is a software engineer. Both of us ended up learning science and, and being in the software industry, and when I go and speak with my mom, I, I ask her, how come you told me not to do those things uh, and you didn't push me? And she was like, because I didn't think that I can do it. When I was your age, women didn't do it. So she just now got walking <laughs> and kind of awakened that it's possible because she is from this generation that, you know what? It's okay, you learn humanities, you do arts, and you get married, and it, everything's going to be fine. Um, so she was like, I thought that's a good thing to do. Um, that's a, it's interesting, the generation gap that we see. Yeah, absolutely. It's, but women are, that were our mentors still not pushing it. My mother, too, she was a teacher, L.A. City School, drove two hours every day, had seven kids. I was number seven. Uh, you know, and she never said to me, you got to go do something. You know, ever. Meanwhile, my father from the Middle East, an immigrant engineer, pushing my brothers to be engineers. One of them is. One of them went to Yale. He's an attorney. And you know, I graduated high school. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> Looking around. Oh, I think I'll go to college. Cool. And of course, you know, look fast forward. But I'll tell you what. As much as it was sort of, it was okay if I didn't. My stepfather, who was African American, uh, came into my life when I was six. He was always telling me, you're a leader, you're amazing, people love you, do something good with it. But he just kept saying, you're a leader, you're a leader. 
And I, there's no way that didn't affect me, you know, in terms of my confidence and willing to take risk and get out there. And that's why I'd say, I bet you we all do, because I think whether it's our parents or somebody else, uh, it's got to be that. That's the, the opportunity piece, right? Yeah. I, guess, I just wanted to go back to our original topic of the, the, the discussion, which was, the, I guess, careers in cybersecurity, and kind of hone in that although healthcare has traditionally been kind to women leadership, and there's a ton of women leadership in healthcare, I mean, in the IT space and in the security space, we don't definitely see as much. Um, but I encourage that, you know, if you really want to study and hone your skills in a specific area, maybe go bury yourself in an industry didn't quite work for me because now healthcare, cybersecurity is <laughs> really larger than I expected it to be in terms of uh, you know political agenda and the national spotlight right now with uh, medical record uh, data breaches. But um, you know, burying yourself in an industry that you actually have an interest in and then working your way up silently in that space allows you to make lateral movement later. So you know, I I would caution against you know thinking that the company that you're you know investing the most of your time in might not be any industry that's you know sexy or appealing to you, but it is going to give you talents and skills and let you kind of sit back maybe and make those observations that will improve uh, your career later. Um, at least that's what's happening from my perspective. Awesome. I think we've got seven more minutes. How about some uh, working with these ladies uh, recently? Heard some stories that I didn't even understand. Uh, one of them just challenges that women still have. So. If you're a man and you're unhappy with your job and you start looking for a job whenever you feel like looking for a job, well, I thought women did the same thing, but I found out just because I didn't biologically have children or birth children, I did not know that, uh, you know, women have to think about that twice because uh, you, if you, most companies won't pay for child birthing in the first year. Right, and so as a woman, you got to think about you know timing and when you can move jobs and careers, and this still happens today. And again, it's all just about awareness, and hopefully, we can all help change these policies. I don't think any organization would really want a woman sticking around just because, right? I don't think that's good for anybody else, or, or right? So maybe as all we as we're out there working uh, in our everyday lives, we can help change those things. We're just you know thinking of things that are different for women than for men, and that is one. And I bet you it does hurt folks a lot in terms of their ability to take risks or put themselves out there or take that job that they that came across their lap that they would love to take, but they know they can't because they're pregnant or they're trying to get pregnant. Right? Crazy, but true. Yeah. controversial I have two two questions yeah. the first is uh, when I think about like not being put correct if I had a position and like oh my god I need to hire this person and then a, a woman who's in her third trimester walks into interview like my initial inclination is uh, and I don't know how to avoid this is like oh my god I need this person to be like working right now I've got this huge project yeah. like is that something that shouldn't enter our train of thought is that something that should like how do you how do you balance that? Because I like I, I think I struggle a little with that. The other thing I struggle with is that uh, 
so our corporate policies reinforce uh, uh, mothers as caregivers. Now, I think childbirth, birth, obviously, me like has a much more uh, physiological impact on, on women, but. Uh, it's much harder for the father to try and take off and help raise the kid for six months because his company gives him, you know, two, four, six weeks, and the woman three, four, five months, right? Mm -hmm. Six months. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm kind of interested in perspective on those on those two two areas. Can I take it? Yeah. Um, I think there is a point about having a very candid discussion with this candidate about when are you coming back, how available are you going to be, and she may not know because it's hard to know in the you last know, trimester. Are, are you, you even going to ask? I'm not even sure if you're allowed uh, to like, you have probably, a You probably are not allowed as of corporate policy and stuff, but I would bring it up. If I come to an interview on my third trim, trimester, I'm going to be very open about it and because I'm not going to hide it, right? There's no way. I mean, it's visual. And, you know, I, I think it's about time we, we kind of open it up. My best employees were women coming back from maternity leave because they were so effective, so efficient, not wasting a minute, really, going to get things done and getting... They didn't waste time in coffee chats and so, not that I'm saying that coffee chats are not important for corporate culture, but... Really, there is something that I think we are being uh, very much PC that prevents us from being human beings. So I don't know what Leo would say about it. I don't know what you know the rules of the corporate is. But I think it's a shame not bringing in somebody in a third trimester. If she do plans to be involved, if she will catch up, if she will be involved, I can tell you, even though I, I took six months off, I was very much involved with my team while I was away, important meetings I attended, I was on conference calls. So even when I was out, I onboarded uh, people that could take over. I think there is some flexibility that we can take, because the same will happen if somebody gets sick. If it's a male and he got sick and he needs to leave for a while, well, that's life. So that's my approach. Uh, not sure that uh, legal would approve on it. Well, it's, it's interesting because I, like, I, like that last thing you said is really important. If I am interviewing a pregnant woman and I want to bring up that conversation and then there's a better candidate that we don't hire, she would have a very legitimate claim uh, of gender discrimination. Right. So, yeah, that's something that I'd, I'd be interested in if there's another attorney, but like it just feels like that is a very taboo conversation. My my wife works for a startup. She's worked for the same uh, serial entrepreneur for four years. We had a daughter. Like she just, I mean, yeah. she works when she has the flu, like the legit swine flu. She's like crawling to the desk. And so I don't, I don't think that that is, uh, like, it's not that you're pregnant. And I can't hire you, but it's the fact that we can't have that conversation. And like anybody that says that thought doesn't cross their mind for a position that requires sure. has an immediate need is not sure. 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 I think. I think. The, yes. One second. I just think the fact that she would show up in her first, in her third trimester. So I she's mean, really. She's she's got her stuff together. And I say, you know what? If we're going to err, let's err on. Um, giving her the benefit of the doubt, she's going to make it work. She's going to show up for you, and she's going to, you know, make things happen. When we're fearful of legal crap, um, that's why I own my own company. And I, I don't care. Uh, that being said, as a man who can help with policies in your type of position, I think that men are also being left out of the childbearing experience of those first critical three, six months that are so, you know, how, you know, important. And so I'd love to see you fighting for equal rights on that too, because how nice would it be if a couple could decide who's going to be at home more based on their career and where it's at, or be there together, or, you know, have that ability to even decide. So I think we need to advance on that of it significantly. I mean, those policies disadvantage women just as much as they disadvantage women. It's much more yeah. women to have it's to terrible. stay home Definitely. and disrupt their career, even though it might not make the most sense for the family. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It might make more sense for the man to stay home based on where they're at. So we need that. Yes? So I just want to make a comment. I um, just recently went through a job search, and I'm not pregnant, but I do have two small children, and um, have been subject to the mom tax throughout my career. And it, I can tell you that it's real. So that aside. So then I just went through a job search and it was fascinating to see the questions that people would ask me. And I will tell you that on two occasions I had men specifically ask me about my children, how old they were, what my husband did, 
whether he traveled a lot, and whether I was prepared for the lifestyle of the startup world. I can also tell you that the company that I chose, but all these are networking sessions. Well, look, I, yeah. But this is the legal but, side of it. But I want to yeah. interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. This is all this just, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get a sense of whether you're the candidate I'm looking for. Sure. And this is, they're bringing their perspective. What I can tell you is that the company I chose to work for, when I met with the woman who was in charge, she did not ask me a damn question about my family. She was interested in whether I could do the job. And that, there's a reason why the laws exist, which is the only thing that's relevant is whether that person can do the job. And, and even if legally they weren't allowed to ask me, I would never work for them. And I will never advise anybody that I would know to go work for someone who would ask that kind of question. So what I that means, like, literally I had one of them say to me, oh, your husband must travel a lot. That must be hard for you. Look, I can't. <laughs> I mean, that I was not going to be a couple, I was like, why would I put myself in a position to apply for a job that I do not believe I could do? So and it's done. It was just done right there. So I, it's, it's what you said. It's made <laughs> They don't trust women to make So, so I can't. I can't speak for all men. I can say that there's a lot of there's a lot of stupid men out there. I can also say, and Deidre knows me knows me well. Latal knows me well. Like I have, like, like we can't. Like there, there are terrible women leaders and there are terrible men leaders. I don't think I have ever asked somebody about uh, about anything related to their family during a job interview because it's not relevant to me. Right? I do think there are very rare instances where it's a relevant, like there's a relevant concern to be had where if I want to hire somebody that is, uh, that needs to have a project that's done by Q3 that is clearly going to have a, a kid in the next three or four months, like there are concerns that if we don't address this as a society and have an open dialogue around without demonizing the fact yeah. that we're having the conversation, there are things that will will continue to occur, and that woman will continue to be discriminated against even though she got laid off and is 100% capable. Like, we have to talk about it. Yeah. We have to figure yeah. out how yeah. we can and have those dialogues. Right. I, I agree. If you didn't choose her, you couldn't ask the question, and she would wonder why didn't get the call back. So I agree with you, open dialogue is, is definitely a step forward, and then it's just how do you, what does that look like? Yeah. It's interesting because I ask all those questions of men and women because I like to know who I'm hiring. You know, what do you do? Where do you come from? What's your story? What's your experience has been? All of that. What's your daily life like such that I can understand the person? And, um, and so, you know, there's, it's so complex, right? And there's a ton of fear to these conversations and questions. And so this generation has to take you know, the past generations and say, you know, we're not going to operate the way you all operate and be bogged down by legalities and help fight for open, transparent conversations. And, and if we do that on top of being equals, you know, and that we're all raising children, that we're all responsible for the children that we bring into this world together, then, you know, I think we can make advances. But this is complex. This is interesting, which is cool. It's so awesome that this community is embracing this topic. At RSA, my talk from pigtails to prom to cyber careers, what about your daughters, was crowdsourced number two out of 35, right? How cool is that? Meaning people, men, white men, you all want to talk about it, uh, which is awesome. And we, meaning like I'm so thankful. So the more we talk, the more this is going to get better, and uh, and again, please, it's all the young girls out there. Spread the word. There's cool careers in cyber, and yes, science is a part of it. Don't shy away from it. Also, understand that if it's not your thing, you, there's other things. There's leadership, right? There's business. There's so much. Uh, so we're out of time by five minutes. But uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you, ladies. Awesome.